and zinc. And the next one is copper. The ore, just like any of the other ores, has to be concentrated. Um, the processes, the general one that we've done is, for example, with froth flotation, where they add the foaming agents and they agitate the mixture and we find that the impurities sink to the bottom, the ore attaches to the foam. All right. So once they've got the ore concentrated, then it is heated with coal and sand and lime. We find that during this heating process, uh, we get the production of copper sulfide. And this is the copper mat. The impurities form a layer of slag that is removed just as any of the others. Then this copper mat has to be heated in air so that the copper sulfide is converted to a crude copper metal, and we call that blister copper. And I think I said to you the other day, we can sometimes see these lorries containing the blister copper traveling through to Swakopmund, all right, coming from Shumep Mine. The sulfur dioxide that is formed, once again, is a pollutant, together with a little bit of arsenic. This has to be removed. All right, people, arsenic itself has got many uses. Um, it is poisonous, so you can make poison with it, but many of the um, industrial processes requires a little bit of arsenic, so they can extract it from the pollution and resell it as a product that can be used usefully. The sulfur dioxide is converted to sulfuric acid, and then mining processes, for example, the mining of uranium requires a bit of sulfuric acid in the extraction of the ore. The blister copper is further refined by electrolysis, so it will be exported to countries, for example, Canada. Okay, we'll be able to purify it by electrolysis. Now, the examples that we've had a look at until now, the iron, the zinc, and the copper, are all fairly unreactive metals. Now, the next metal that must be extracted from its ore is aluminium. And aluminium is quite high up on the reactivity list. In actual fact, aluminium is quite reactive. So when we have to extract the aluminium from the ore, it becomes more complicated. All right? So reducing it in a furnace with coke or carbon, it doesn't work because there's not enough energy for the carbon to remove the oxygen from the aluminium. So we use a different process specifically called electrolysis. Now electrolysis is very high energy because we need electricity to send it through this molten ore, okay? And we need to melt the ore. And they have usually got fairly high melting points. So specifically with aluminium, um, it must be extracted by electrolysis because it's very reactive. The ore, the name of the ore is bauxite, has a very high melting point, approximately 215 degrees, which means for you to heat it up to that temperature is going to require very large amounts of energy. So what they're going to do is they go and dissolve a mixture called cryolite. Now, cryolite is a sodium aluminium fluoride compound that they go and add to this. And the moment they do that, we find that the melting point of this cryolite mixture is lower. Yes? No. No. If you refer to cryolite, it's fine. Okay. Once they've got the ore in the melted state, it's in a container. Now, people, these containers aren't this size. They're like as big as this room. Okay? And um, actually, what I want to do before I do specifically aluminium, I just want to explain electrolysis to you. If I have a container of a metal oxide, doesn't matter which one, 
all right? And I want to separate the metal from the oxygen by electrolysis. It will work as follows. I will need two electrodes. All right, now these electrodes can be made from metals as long as they won't melt in this mixture or we can use carbon because they are a graphite is a good conductor okay so very often they use carbon electrodes now we go and push a current through them remember this mixture over here is a molten salt or dissolved salt so it will conduct i need a fairly large current Positive pole, negative pole. So this electrode is positive and that electrode is negative. The name of a positive electrode is an anode. And the negative electrode is a cathode. All right. Now, this metal ore that we've got over here, the metal part and the non-metal part, the metal is going to have a positive charge and the non-metal will have a negative charge. It's an ionic compound. Yes. Okay. If I have an ionic compound, a negatively charged particle is going to be attracted towards the positive. It's as simple as that. There. So there goes my negative particle. And my positive particle is attracted to the negative electrode. The negative particle is an anion. Anions are attracted to the anode. Don't confuse them. The anode is positive, but the anion is negative. Similarly, the cathode will attract the cation. Okay. What's going to happen at these electrodes? Well, the oxygen actually has a minus 2 charge. Okay. When it makes contact with this electrode, this electrode is positive. What does that mean in terms of electrons? It's got a deficit. All right, so what this oxygen is going to go and do, it's going to form oxygen and it's going to release its two electrons. Now, if I balance it, then I will have four electrons there, but it's going to release its electrons. When something loses electrons, the process is oxidation. All right, the metal ion that is attracted to the negative electrode is going to gain an electron and it's going to form the metal. Are you following? When elements gain electrons, we refer to it as... So the metal is still reduced from the ore during electrolysis. Okay. Now I can go back to the aluminium process. Now, when we're going to have a look at the extraction of aluminium, they go and set up the system slightly differently. This very large container is lined with a layer of carbon, actually graphite, and it is connected to the negative pole of the power supply. So the negative electrode is the lining of the container. The positive electrode, here yeah, you can see them very clearly, are very large blocks of carbon that is lowered into this molten ore. Okay? So now in this we've got aluminium oxide, so I have got aluminium 3 plus and oxygen minus 2 ions. Where will the metal go? It will be attracted to the negative electrode, which is the lining of the container. 
Okay, so the aluminium is going to gain three electrons and it's going to form aluminium metal. And the aluminium metal will form a layer down here on the bottom of the container from where it can be tapped off. All right, so this is an ongoing process. They can keep on adding extra ore to it and they can keep on tapping off the formed aluminium metal. One of the things that happens also is that this oxygen is going to be attracted to the positive electrodes. Now this is at a very high temperature. What will carbon do if the temperature is high enough and there is oxygen? It's going to react. So what happens is that at the anode, the formed oxygen <coughs> is going to react with the electrodes and they are going to burn away. They're going to form carbon dioxide. But that's not a problem because they simply, once it's burnt away, it'll take, they'll have them on a certain size so that after a certain period of time it's burnt away, they will simply go and replace it. And we can see that on one of the videos that I have that we will have a look at. Okay. So, the extraction of aluminium is with electrolysis. The container in which the ore goes, the lining of that container is made from carbon. It's the negative electrode. The positive electrodes are large blocks of carbon that they lower into the molten cryolite mixture. Then they allow electric current to flow through. The moment they do that, we find that aluminium metal is reduced or the aluminium ions are reduced to form the metal, which is tapped off. And the formed oxygen is going to react with the carbon electrodes, eventually burning them away so they will have to be replaced at specific time intervals. All right, so just let's have a look there. An electric current is passed through the molten cryolite via a cathode and then anode. What is a cathode? Negative electrode and then anode is a positive electrode. The lining of the container is the negative electrode, the cathode. All right? The positive electrodes are large blocks of carbon that is lowered into the container with a molten cryolite. Aluminium ions, the metal ions, they are positive, are attracted to the cathode, which is the negative electrode. It's just Coulomb forces. All right, opposite charges attract. And it will collect at the bottom of the container from where it can be tapped off. The oxygen is attracted to the anodes because the oxygen ions are negative. When they make contact with the anode, they will give off their electrons and they will form oxygen. And the anodes will slowly but surely burn away with the oxygen that is produced during this process. And they say it's replaced more or less every 24 hours. All right. That is the extraction of aluminium. Aluminium is actually a very interesting metal. Um, in the early 19th century, late 18th century, aluminium metal was actually considered to be as precious as gold because it was very scarce. It was very difficult for them to get pure aluminium. Only later on did they realize that aluminium oxide is everywhere. All right? Yeah, it's not at all scarce. What makes aluminium expensive is the extraction process because it's very energy rich. Okay. Uh, there's my diagram. Uses of the metals. Alloys are molten mixtures of metals. People, when we make an alloy, it, intends, or it tends to improve properties like strength and rust resistance. People, the uh, change in the properties are fairly easily explained. If I have positive atomic rests in an orderly arrangement, all right, 
if I go and disrupt that crystal lattice by putting in a larger atom of a different element, can you see that those layers won't be able to slide as easily? They will hook on these different sized atoms. That's why alloys in general are harder than what the pure metal would be. A <clears throat> couple of alloys that you need to know the names of. Duralumin consists of aluminium, copper, and magnesium, and they build aeroplanes with it. Remember, aeroplanes are very large structures. They're very heavy. The heavier they are, the harder it is to get them in the air. Costs more money, requires more fuel. So by making the aeroplane as light as possible, it eventually leads to making more money in terms of better fuel consumption. Eh? Okay, so duralumin consists of aluminium, copper, and magnesium. Then two very well-known ones, brass and bronze. Take note, brass with the S's contains zinc with a Z. And bronze with a Z contains tin with the S. All right, don't go and confuse them because one very easily does. So brass and bronze, both of them are very corrosion resistant, very hard, um, easily shaped by pressing it or by hammering it or by heating it and molding it. All right. So for brass, we make doorknobs and ornaments. For bronze, large structures like ships, propellers, bells, the bell outside in the courtyard will be made from bronze. Statues are made very often from bronze because it's very heavy, so it's not easy to carry it away. Um, it's fairly, well, I don't think it's most expensive metal to work with, okay? And it's f fairly freely available. The next alloy, copro nickel, our silver coins, the 10 cent piece and the 50 cent coin, okay? It's a silver coin, they're fairly light, quite strong, it's very difficult to bend it. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Okay. Copro nickel consists of copper and nickel, light and strong. We make silver coins from them. In the olden days, many years ago, a coin was made from pure silver or gold. And the trading value of that coin was the value of the metal. And that is how money originated. Um, at a certain point in time, the value of the gold or the silver in the coin was more than the buying power of that coin. So then people started melting down the coins so that they could sell the silver or the gold for more money than what they could buy with the coin. So eventually, <laughs> governments changed the way in which they made coin. The silver coin itself is now a cheaper coin. And it trades for the value on the coin, which is connected to inflation, etc. Okay? So in silver coins, we no longer have silver. And in the brass colored coins, there is no longer any gold. All right? Um, so we make coins specifically light and strong, copper and nickel. Then titanium alloy <coughs> used in aeroplane structures. Um, made from titanium and iron and carbon. Solder. If you've ever looked at somebody soldering, they've got a hot, hot piece of iron point with a wire that's very soft and flexible, and it melts very easily. And they can use it to join wires, for example, on uh, little um, electronic boards. Okay, little drop of solder fixes the of the uh, components into the board. All right. It's a good conductor, so it will conduct electricity. It's a mixture of lead and zinc. It has a very low melting point. Okay. It tends not to corrode. Uses of copper, electrical wiring. All right. That's probably the most well-known use for copper. We can also use copper for water pipes. The reason why they use them for water pipes is they don't corrode. All right. 
They are unreactive, so it doesn't react with the water. And we can make cooking pans with copper. In the olden days, probably your grandmother's family, they would have one pot made from copper. And that is the pot she would use to make jam and pickle vegetables and salad stuff. All right? Why? The other pots were either iron pots or aluminium. Both those metals tend to react with acids. If I cook food in a three-legged iron pot, I can't leave it overnight. I must take it out of the container and put it in a glass dish. Otherwise, the next morning, that food is spoiled. You can't eat it because the iron has dissolved in the food. Yes. That's to prevent it from rusting. Yes. That's just to prevent it from rusting. Okay, but that's why you don't leave the food in the pot. The old people, they only had aluminium pots or iron pots. When they had finished cooking the food, what did they do with the food? They put it into glass containers. Opskebakis. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, but you know what? Yes, now you must wash all those pots and dishes. Why don't we take the food and put it into a glass dish anymore? Well, I don't. I put my pot on the table because my pot is made from stainless steel. And stainless steel doesn't react with the food. The old people took it out of the pots because the pots, if the food is standing in that pot, is going to react with the food. All right, they put it into a glass container because the glass is unreactive, yes. Um, yes, but in too large amounts, it's also not good for you. Okay. So we, yes, that is why the old people used to dish up from the pots that they had on the stove. I think many of them didn't want to know why they did it. Um, that is why they'd say, oh, okay, why don't you put the food in the glass dish to put on the table? That wasn't the reason for it. Yes, it does look nice, but that wasn't the main reason. They had to remove the food from the pot because the pot was made from a reactive metal. Okay, and it will react with the food. So, um, copper then, high quality cooking pans. It's a good conductor of heat and it will not rust or corrode. Steel, steel people, is a very useful metal. Um, one of the parameters that they use to measure the industrialization of a country is how much steel is used per year. Because the use of steel is indicative of building structures, producing things. All right. So steel people, very useful. Remember, pure iron is fairly soft. When we start adding carbon to the iron, we get what we call steel. And it's harder than pure iron. Now, you get varying grades of steel. The first one we refer to as cast iron. It contains a relatively large amount of carbon. This makes the steel fairly rigid, strong. But if you drop them, there's a chance they can break because they are brittle, because they are so rigid. If you remove some of the carbon and you've got less than 0.3% carbon, we get the steel we make car bodies from. All right? Low carbon steels. Then medium carbon steels contain between 0.3 and 0.8% carbon railway lines. Those metal tracks that the train runs on are made from medium carbon steel. Must be fairly strong and rigid, but must it be so strong that it is, would be brittle and can snap? No. Okay. Then the high carbon steels, 0.8 to 1.5. We use them in knives, ones that they show on television how they are forged in fire. All right, that would be fairly high carbon steels because those blades must be fairly rigid and strong. Okay, and it must be able to keep its sharpness. So razor blades and knives are made from high carbon steels. 
the alloys that we get with steel. So if I talk about chromium steel, I've taken steel, which is iron and carbon, and I've added chromium to it. All right. Now, you don't need to remember the specific amounts of metal that is added. Just know that chromium steel is steel with chromium in it, commonly used as ball bearings. Cobalt steel contains cobalt, commonly used as magnets. Molybdenum steel for gun barrels contains molybdenum. Stainless steel contains chromium and nickel. And stainless steel is very versatile. We make sinks from them, cutlery from them. Surgical instruments are made from stainless steel because it doesn't corrode. It's very strong. Okay. Tungsten steel. Tool, tools, armor plating. Vanadium steel, spanners, tools. Sometimes chrome vanadium. Then there's vanadium and chrome in it. All right. There are many alloys, people. These are just a few. Okay. Tungsten contains W, element W. Tungsten. Tungsten has two names also known as wolfram. There. Okay, that's why it's a symbol W. We refer to it as tungsten. Zinc. Used in making of dry cells, torch lights, torch batteries. Okay. The casing is made from zinc. We use zinc in galvanizing and to make alloys brass. Aluminium, even though it is high on the reactivity series, aluminium seems to be unreactive. For example, aluminium is more reactive than iron. So I'm building myself a little house at Swakopmund. Can I put in steel window frames? Why not? It's going to rust away. I will be working on those frames for the rest of my life to prevent them from rusting. But can we put in aluminium frames? Yes. But isn't this a contradiction? Isn't aluminium more reactive than steel? It is. But yes, aluminium reacts very rapidly with oxygen and it forms a layer of aluminium oxide and this aluminium oxide has the ability to stick onto the aluminium thereby sealing off the aluminium from exposure to oxygen and water and whatever there is in the environment and that is why it seems as if aluminium does not react all right. It is unreactive because it's covered by a layer of aluminium oxide that seals it off. All right. If I have my steel window frame, if the paint is chipped, it's going to rust. Okay. The aluminium oxide, can the aluminium oxide chip off the aluminium? No, because it immediately forms new aluminium oxide, which sticks onto the aluminium. All right, and that prevents the aluminium from rusting. So even though aluminium is high up on the reactivity series, it's very reactive, it seems to be unreactive. The reason is it forms a layer of aluminium oxide that has the ability to stick onto the surface. This prevents anything from coming into contact with the aluminium. And it's this property that makes aluminium very useful. Okay, it's light, it's corrosion resistant, it's a very good heat conductor. And that makes aluminium very useful. Now, because metals are used very widely, um, it becomes very costly if these structures that we build with the metals start corroding and rusting. So a lot of research has gone into how do we prevent corrosion or rusting of metals. And very simply, it's very basic. The one way is you cover the metal with something that prevents oxygen and water from coming into contact with it. The other method is very simply by, for example, if we've got steel, we can galvanize it, we cover it with a more reactive metal. Okay? So metals react with oxygen. It forms an oxide. That is corrosion. 
When I use the term rusting, I am actually referring to iron or steel that reacts with oxygen in the presence of water. But chemically speaking, it's the same reaction that is occurring. It's an oxidation reaction. The metal loses its electrons, and then it can react with whatever there is in the environment. So um, we can prevent water and air getting to the metal by covering the metal with paint, layer of oil or grease or wax or plastic or any other less reactive metal. For example, I can take a piece of steel and I can plate it with gold. Will the steel rust? No, because the oxygen can't get to it. The gold layer prevents it. Okay, it seals off the steel. The other method of preventing corrosion or rusting is by galvanizing the metal, all right? And it's referred to also as sacrificial metal protection. For example, I have got iron, all right? If it rusts, I have iron oxide. If I have some zinc in contact with it, the zinc and the iron fight over the oxygen. The zinc is more reactive, so it wins the fight, and it will form zinc oxide plus iron. So the iron can't rust, because the moment it rusts, the zinc displaces it, and we are left with iron. And that is why galvanizing works very well, because even if the metal is not completely covered with the zinc, Metals are conductors, so the electrons can flow. And that is why in the Wallfish Bay Harbor, they take the steel hulls of the ship, all right, and they fix magnesium onto it. And magnesium works even better because magnesium is even more reactive than zinc. And it will immediately displace any iron oxide that is formed. And those steel hulls, can't rust or they don't rust because of the sacrificial metal protection. And all that they're going to do is when they see, oh, this magnesium strip is now becoming used up, they just pop rivet another strip onto it. Okay. Why can't we use magnesium on our cars to prevent them from rusting? Yes, magnesium can burn. They fix the magnesium on the outside of the hole, there where there is water. So there's no danger of that magnesium starting to burn. All right. Um, we use galvanizing on corrugated iron sheets that we use for roofing structures in our homes. The mining industry and the metal extraction processes cause large amounts of pollution. Unfortunately, that is so. Before they started the B2 gold mine, the people wanted to know what is going to happen to the pollutants. Where is it going to go? And I know at the Beta Gold Mine, they go to a lot of expense and trouble to prevent polluted water from ending up in the water system. They've got dams that they monitor and evaporate off the water from leaving behind the pollutants, etc. Okay, so mining industry, unfortunately, causes very large amounts of pollution. That is why mining must always be done with responsibility. And that's one of the um, things that the Beauty Gold Mine uses when they sort of advertise the, mo the mine. They uh, uh, refer to responsible mining, okay, processes that they do. So it pollutes both air and water. So it must be done responsibly and in a sustainable way. They can't keep using decent, clean, drinkable water polluting it and just releasing it into the system that they can't do because that's not responsible, all right? Especially in Namibia because water is one of our natural resources that is always under pressure. Yeah. Um, even though recycling of metals is an expensive process, waste and scrap metals should be recycled because the sources are limited. Technically speaking, people, everything that is on the earth and in the crust of the earth it's all that there is. If you've removed one substance 
continuously for a long period of time and you hold it in a form that is not available to the environment, somewhere along the line there isn't going to be any more of that. Okay, so it's very important to recycle different materials. There are natural processes that cause metals to decay, for example, but they are very slow. All right. So sometimes then it is necessary, especially with steel, where we use a lot of steel, that they recycle old waste steel. Corrosion and its prevention. To prevent metals reacting with oxygen, what must you do? You must insulate it from the oxygen, prevent the oxygen from making contact. Uh, prevent water and air from making contact with the metal by painting it, plastic coating it, attaching a less reactive metal to it, rub, rubbing a layer of oil or grease over it. That layer that you put over it prevents oxygen and moisture from coming into contact with the metal. If there's no oxygen and moisture contacting the metal, can it react? No. Cover the metal with a more reactive one, galvanizing. We've just had a look at the galvanizing process. Okay. And I think that is the end of that chapter.